<laughs> Everyone's putting their hands up. Put your hands down. Everyone's putting their hands up. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> All right, 120 on. Mr. Meenan, sir. Hi, Paul. All right. Um... Okay, right. I think I think we're. Uh, I think everyone's here. Hundred. Oh, two more. Let's start slowly. Welcome back, everybody. Um, second webinar of the day. This one is an introduction to BS seven nine oh nine. In this one, my father's going to take the reins on this one because he has worked in seven nine oh nine for a number of years, and he would, would, would be fair to say you pop that you developed the first. City and Guild accredited program in the subject. It was the it was the first accredited program, yes. Yeah, accredited cool. to City right. and Guild. So yeah. all right, so um, I'm gonna sit here, kind of going, and I'm gonna offer some questions because I like to I like to get involved as well. But um, I'm gonna, I'm here to take part as well. But I'm gonna hand over to Pop, uh, Pop. So um, take away. Okay, well, welcome to as David said, second webinar of the day. This one's going to be covering temporary electrical systems. Uh, BS7909. It's just an introduction to what BS7909 is about uh, um, and just gives a bit of detail about the type of installations and the type of equipment and a little bit on the inspection and testing and why we might want to use a BS7909 protocol rather than BS7671. My experience in this, I've been doing temporary electrical systems for longer than I care to remember. Um, uh, when I first started doing this 40 odd years ago, we used to do things with uh, flexes and box, wooden boxes full of old fuse boards with 13 amp sockets all around it, wired into an earth. And we would literally just plug huge amounts of extension leads in. Um, thankfully, things have developed a bit since then, and we now have the proper equipment, which has been around for a number of years. That is continuing to develop, continuing to change um, as technology changes. Uh, and we need to just keep on top of that. The recent introduction of the type ARCDs, which has actually been around for uh, temporary installations for a number of years. The guidance has, but uh, nobody's actually taken any notice of it. So hopefully now things are beginning to change. So we're going to just push on through this. Uh, please get involved with the polls and the chats. Uh, ask any questions you like, and we will do our best to answer what we can. So, BS7909, an introduction. What is BS7909? Well, it is a code of practice. It's a British standard. It's a code of practice. It takes the form of guidance and recommendations. It's, it's assumed that the execution of it is going to be entrusted to appropriately knowledgeable and experienced people. So, how many of you have actually worked, uh, have heard of or have worked with BS7909? Okay, that's our first little poll question there. How many of you actually heard about this? How many of you actually worked with it? And when you look at the actual title, there's a few things to take note of there. It talks about entertainment and related purposes, and it talks about electrical systems rather than electrical installations. And that's important. And as we go through this, you'll see why using that terminology is important. So we talk about the entertainment industry directly from BS7909, the definitions, entertainment industry. And there's a huge amount of things there from theater and opera and concerts through to live stage performances, things like Glastonbury, uh, major sporting events, all sorts of things. They can be indoor, they can be outdoor, they can be a mixture of the two. Okay, but the one thing that it all has in common is entertainment. Uh, whichever way you want to define entertainment. And we talk about temporary electrical systems, also from definitions in 7909, and it talks about all the equipment ranging from the switch gear and the generators through to the final sockets at the end of it, okay, including all the protection, all the monitoring devices, measuring devices, everything which is actually not permanent that makes up a temporary electrical system. So when you consider what's the difference between a temporary electrical system 
and a fixed installation, the temporary electrical system comes out at the end of its use. Okay, it's put in for a particular event, it comes out after its use. So we, we've looked at things like, and have been involved with things like Glastonbury, um, major sporting events like Royal Ascot, dealing with outcast, uh, outside broadcast vehicles um, that go around the countryside. And these are major bits of technology, these things, and they're quite often fed by 125 amp uh, three-phase supply, but they need to be plugged in somewhere. It also involves small smaller systems like maybe a school fate you might just be putting out a couple of extension leads for a pa system and an ice cream van okay it's still a temporary system and so it still needs to be properly installed properly inspected and tested okay and verified and it could be indoor stuff like theater so are these systems not properly covered by bs 7671 well BSM 671 regulation 110.1.3 says that the regulations need to be supplemented by the requirements of other British or harmonised standards. And number nine of that list is temporary electrical systems for events, entertainment and related purposes, BS 7909. BS 7909 is far more relevant to temporary systems than to fixed installations in a number of ways. It deals with the type of equipment, that we're going to be using to put the, the installation or the system in and the inspection and testing protocol which for temporary systems has to be different to fixed installations otherwise you just haven't got a hope in hell of actually achieving it bs 767 one uh, defines a temporary installation as an electrical installation which is erected for a particular purpose and dismantled when no longer required for that purpose. And there is no time limit set. So how, how long is a piece of string? You could have a temporary system that goes in for a few hours. You could have a temporary system that goes in for a number of days or a number of weeks or a number of months. Okay. The main requirement, if it goes in and it stays in for a extended period of time is to reinspect and retest it. But, Functionally, the actual system can stay in for however long it's needed, and then it gets pulled out. Now, we could argue that all electrical systems get pulled out at the end of their lifetime, but common sense prevails. We know what we're talking about here. We're talking about a temporary system, not a fixed installation near a building. So do we need to even uh, refer to BS7671? Well, yes, we do because it covers the fundamental principles of electrical systems. It talks about design, it talks about protection, it talks about all sorts of things like earth fault protection, earthing, bonding, okay? So we need to always refer to BS 7671 as well in the design process. BS 7671 also does cover some aspects which actually infringe on temporary systems. In part seven, we've got 708, which is caravan and camping parks. Now, many festivals, uh, sporting events, and major sort of uh, other events, you'll have staff and maybe the, the public living or staying in caravans. Um, so there needs to be a supply for those. So we would have to then refer to 708, looking at things like, you know, can we supply them from a PME system, right? Which we know is a no-no. Um, 740, temporary electrical systems for structures, amusement devices, and booths at fairgrounds. Okay, a lot of the major festivals will have fairgrounds as part of the entertainment, as part of the uh, facilities that are provided to the public. So there is a crossover there. Then we've got other things like exhibition shows and stands. Now, they're a bit of a strange one because some might argue that they're not for entertainment, so they have to be wired to BS 7671. But when you actually come to the practical uh, installation and the inspection and testing of an exhibition show and stands, um, quite often BS 7909 provides a better solution. Consider also mobile transportable units, like the outside broadcast vehicle, like catering wagons, 
that turn up on a lot of these events, they all need a supply. We need to refer to 7671 as well as 7909. And also now, electric vehicle charging. More and more now, major events may have to supply electric vehicle charging units in their car parks. So there's a lot of crossover between temporary events in the entertainment industry and some of the sections of part seven of the wiring rigs. Some of these are very grave. They do merge, they're blurred. Things like exhibition shows and stands. Okay, in the wiring regs, it says that it applies to the temporary electrical installations in exhibition shows and stands, including the mobile and portable displays to protect users. But then it says it does not apply to electrical systems as defined in BS 7909, used for structures, sets, and mobile units. So there's a bit of a blur in here. The exhibitions are temporary, but are they entertainment? Does 711 apply? or does BS 7909 apply? If we go back to 7909, they actually define an event as an occurrence that is entertainment, such as sporting, commercial, business, yeah, public or private festival. So something like Elex, for instance, that we're all fairly familiar with, does the wiring of the trade stands in Elex come under 7909 as entertainment? Okay, because under 7909 it's an event, commercial or business, or does it come under 711? Okay, uh, and then again, why would it matter? So, what do you think? Do you think it comes under a 711? Do you think it comes under 7909? Why does it actually matter? Well, when we look into the wiring of uh, these things, quite often, I think you'll probably agree with me that some of these exhibitions quite often wired with odd bits of flex and twin and earth uh, using old consumer units that are mounted on brackets uh, sometimes strung on a piece of string um, they're not always uh, shall we say suitable and safe quite often thrown together if it's installed in that way where we're using pieces of cable which we then have to terminate into socket outlets and into fuse boards okay effectively making it part of 7671 section 711 it will then have to be tested to chapter 64. this then requires an eic it also requires all the full range of testing so we're looking at continuity tests insulation resistance tests and then we start livening up and doing earth fault loop and fault current and all the rest of it in polarity so the actual installation and the inspection and testing protocol is different to 7909. We'd have to produce all the documentation. If you consider the time taken to produce your EIC, your schedules of inspections, and your schedules of test results, and this has got to be, uh, you'll have a schedule of test results for every single fuse board in that temporary exhibition. The time and effort involved in that quite often means that, well, you'd have to bring guys in about three weeks earlier. Alternatively, we could wire an exhibition using temporary electrical systems, using the pre-assembled, pre-tested equipment. If we do that, then we can use the BS7909 protocol for inspection and testing. Because all the equipment has been pre-tested, pre-inspected off-site, when it comes on-site, we can simply plug it all together, get it livened up, and then do a few live tests fill out the right documentation, and the exhibition is ready to go. In my view, this is the way forward for exhibitions. We should be wiring to BS7909. It is a temporary install, after all, temporary system, after all. Arguably, is it entertainment? Is it not entertainment? I think, really, we need to sort of forget about that argument and just look to see which system, which way of operating is fit for purpose, which provides us with a safer solution a usable solution, a manageable solution. When we've done a BS7909 inspection and test, we'll also produce a certificate of electrical completion to say, yes, the system's all ready, it's all done. And we'll hand that to the event manager. The process is much, much, much quicker. 
it's more relevant to the equipment that's being used and the environment that these systems are going into. It's a far more manageable system of inspection and testing and certification. Okay. And it allows the person who's responsible, the qualifying supervisor, uh, to carry out the responsibilities under electricity at work regulations and PUA. It's a much, much better solution for this type of event. And this is one of the issues we have when we're looking at electrical systems, when we're looking at using the wiring rigs, when we're looking at using all the other British standards. Remember, they all have in their preface, it's down to you guys. Use your own skill and judgment as to how you apply these things. It's a bit spooky, really. So temporary electrical systems is all about getting a supply, yeah, from a supply to a load. Basically, how much power do you want and where do you want it? Unlike our normal sort of offices, we can't use standard equipment. Standard extension lead uh, uh, doesn't really, when you're looking at some of these events where we're using three phase, 32 amp, 63 amp, 125 amp. Yeah, the use of standard extension leads is not right. It's not right for the environment. It's not right for the actual task that's happening. Uh, it's just not suitable. There's, a, there's an interesting comment there in the... Um in the chat by, by somebody who says, often the venue will specify how they want it to be treated. He's known various conference centers actually want the work to be done under 7-Eleven. This is clearly going to be stressing or asking for a much more detailed level of work because it'd have to have the full certification carried out to... If, if that's what they want, yeah. if that's what they want, great. But are they going to allow the time and the money for the proper inspection and testing protocol? And this is where the issue comes is that People want these things done, but then don't allow sufficient time and money yeah, to sure. actually allow them to be done and finished off properly. Yeah, I mean, well, from, so, from, my, from my experience in the sector, because this, cause this, a lot of this is hired equipment, it's always hired in at the very last minute. Yes. Uh, and so often we find ourselves on sites where equipment has just been hired in, and the second it's hired in, you've got stock arriving to go into fridges and stuff, and there's just little to no time for verification in the middle it's really hard it's mm. a real it's a real management activity that can easily be um ignored or just you know yeah. minimized the overriding thing always is that uh, the cost is king isn't it and everybody's on about cost mm. and so things are brought in we don't hire the stuff in until the last minute we don't actually go into the the uh, venue until the last minute to minimize the actual cost of labor and services and everything else and then it's a case if you've got to get it in and installed and working as quickly as possible um and what about the inspection and testing well let's let's not bother with that because that's just a piece of paper we'll fill that in the van mm -hmm. um and this is one of the issues we have with electrical systems generally is that not enough time is given over to the proper inspection testing and certification of electrical installations because we're always fighting against cost yeah, uh, and yeah. we need to start saying to customers, "Hang on, if you want this done properly, this is what you're going to have to allow for." Uh, it, it's a it's a long road, I know, but we've got to travel it. Mm -hmm. ben, Ben's asked an interesting question: How long is temporary? But uh, yeah, yeah, yes, I've had I've had temporary installations that have been in for six months, nine months. Um, on those that, occasions, you have to have some ongoing monitoring, surely. What you what you then have to do is, as the design uh, engineer actually installing or, or responsible for the design and the install of it you would then say okay fair enough we will do the inspection and testing here's your certification but we need to re-inspect in depending on how it's being used it could be you could be testing it every couple of weeks you'd be mm. just testing it every month you could be testing it every three months depends on how it's being used and who it's being used by if you've got a system that's going to be absolutely battered yeah and going to be altered around and changed and it's going to be subject to all sorts of nonsense you know mechanical damage rainstorms coming in and everything else you might want to be inspecting and testing that very regularly think yeah. of it like a construction site yeah where we can have differing sort of like periods of time between inspections and tests whereas if you've got something like a theater where you might have a setup for a long-running theater show do you really need to inspect and test that every week or every couple of days or could you do it every month or could you do it every two months? Because the system is not getting so battered and moved around and everything else, then your inspection and testing protocol can be different. 
But again, it comes down to your skill and judgment. Mm. Okay. And this is, this is the area where people are not happy. Oh, I've got to make that call. Yeah. Make that call. You know, go back to your basic electrical knowledge and your skills and your, uh, your, your knowledge of systems and make that call guys. Mm. You can do this. It's one of the issues. I mean, Ross has just pointed something out. It's an issue that we get where we go to do commissioning of a system that other companies or other organizations have actually constructed. The generator's been turned on, the equipment's been turned on, so the lights mm. are on. People are jumping on it. They're plugging in. They're using the equipment. Oh, yeah. We've not yet verified yeah. it. Uh, no. If we were to go to the generator and lock it all off, that's just a, you know, that's just something that the control procedure doesn't really fit, you know, yeah. for us to actually do that. But it is, yeah, we see that a lot where people will t jump on the system before we've affected it. We've had this. We've actually had fridges yeah. and machinery where we test there's no impedances or the impedances are just yeah. off the charts, you know. I've, I'll, let, I've sorry, had, I'll, I'll let you carry on. I've had flames coming out the sides of cables, <laughs> you know, on an installation because somebody's turned it on before I've inspected and tested it. Uh, yeah. I think there's a problem there, chaps, you know. Um, this is always something we're fighting against. Remember that all the equipment is pre-inspected and pre-tested, mm. okay? But it but. would be nice to actually have a, a worked sort of system of energizing and whatever, although it is important for the guys that are installing, as we'll see when we come to the inspection and testing process, to actually start or to be installing it and actually have a live supply so they can test things like RCDs. Set yeah. the RCDs up if they're uh, and, uh, digital. Okay, so it's important then that they have a live supply to do it with. Mm -hmm. okay. It's a different way of working to fixed installations, yeah, where we Definitely. haven't actually constructed the installation. We're just literally, it's like a Lego system. We're plugging it together. Okay. Okay. Okay, so we've got a range of different sizes of supply systems, um, depending on how much power we need. Uh, and we can get this from, uh, we've got power lock there, we've got um, C form, we can even have a 13 amp socket if it's a small system for maybe a PA for a, a school um, fate or even a, a parent's evening or whatever. It's still a temporary system. It still needs to be installed and properly laid out and needs to be thought about. We don't just throw these things in. Okay. Um, yeah, depending on the size of the supply we need, we could be re using a variety of different sources. Um, C form, we can go up to 125 amp three phase. Uh, with power lock, we'd be look at looking at 250 or, or 400 amps three phase. Uh, that's fine if we've got the fixed supply coming off of a, a switch room somewhere or a socket on a wall that we can use, providing it's all safe. But on occasions, there may not be a suitable supply or it may be too far away. So quite often generators are used with temporary systems. They're a really good solution. They can be placed nearer to your load, so it cuts down on the length of your cables, which then cuts down your volt drop, okay? Nowadays, generators are fairly quiet, so we can drop them into various locations and hide them. Um, and as I say, it cuts down on the amount of equipment then, how many cables, large cables and distro we need you know, large lengths of cables and stuff. So by using intelligent use of generators around the site, we can restrict the lengths of cables, the lengths of equipment, the numbers of equipment, and also cut down, very importantly, cut down on volt drop. One of the biggest issues with temporary systems is the distances we have to run. And it's not unknown for us to be running two, three, even 400 meters to supply a load, okay? When you start running those sorts of distances, uh, you see your voltage disappearing. So another little poll here. Have you actually dealt with supplies from generators, you guys? How many of you actually dealt with getting supplies from generators and worked with generators before? Just give you a moment to click onto that. And I should move on. So we need to get the right um, power around the event. We need obviously cables and distribution boxes. The boxes themselves uh, provide several functions. They give us control, they give us overcurrent protection, they give us earth fault protection. They come in a multitude of sizes and different shapes. You can have them bespoke, you can get them made to order, okay? You can go to companies and they'll have a, a number of boxes they do as a standard thing. And depending on what you need, Okay, you will buy a certain amount of each type of box and that will help you to get your supplies around where you need them. 
Obviously, we need something to link the boxes together, so we need cabling. Now, the cables should be, if we're using them outdoors, should be HO7, RNF, or equivalent. Right? Uh, any PVC cables, Arctic blue, orange horrible things that people use, yellow 110 volt stuff, uh, white PVC flexes and black PVC flexes, uh, are not good enough for outdoors. SY, which is the the uh, braided cable with the clear PVC over the top, okay, again, is not suitable for outdoor use. PVC degrades in sunlight. All of those cables will degrade in sunlight. You can use them indoors, but why would you then have a stock of cables you can use for indoor events and a stock of cables you can only use for outdoor events? Uh, and what most companies do is they'll buy one lot of cables, which are good for both. If you're buying HO7, make sure, or if you think you're buying HO7, make sure that it's actually written on the cable itself. The standard, the size, everything should be written on the cable itself and clearly, uh, obviously seen so that you know what you're picking up. And there's a number of other cables that people sell, cheap sort of stuff that uh, doesn't comply. So make sure you check the specification on the cable. As I say, cables for indoor use, yes, you can use SY, you can use PVC flexes. But remember, with PVC flexes especially, you've got limited mechanical protection. SY cable can be used indoors. It's generally used for actually connecting up pieces of equipment. That's what it was originally intended for. Um, but yeah, if you've got lengths of SY, yes, you can use them indoors, but only indoors. As I say, most companies will, rather than having a mix, they'll just have one standard cable, HO7. It saves on confusion. People get an HO5 and HO7 confused, and it saves on, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a better safe, much improved safety cable, so stick with that. Connections, we're gonna be using C form, um, commando, whatever you wanna call them, industrial plugs, yeah, 60309-2, British standard, uh, in a range of sizes from 16 amp, single phase, 32 amp single phase, 63 amp single phase, uh, and then three phase, 32, 63, 125, uh, 16, three phase, certain pieces of kit. Okay. Um, the idea is that obviously anything for outdoors must be at least YP44. Depending on the environment you're in, you may need to increase that to IP67 if there's jet washing and all sorts of other things going on. Um, if you're going to be dropping it into lakes and ponds, then uh, you need to use something else. Yeah, you've got to be up to IPX8. So um, you use the appropriate connections for the appropriate design and the appropriate environment that you're going to be working into. As a minimum, C form, yeah, are IP44, as long as they have been properly made off. Um, one of the issues we do have is if you've got a big opening in the back of the uh, socket outlet, and a small cable going in, so you can actually drive a bus in next to the cable uh, under that configuration, and obviously they're not even IP44. So I'll make sure they're properly made off. So when we're looking at the distro, we've got ISUs, your intake switch unit. These are the primary interface between your supply and your system. Um, I'd prefer personally to have an ISU with an isolator on it because I'm a control freak, and I will stick a, a padlock on it until I'm ready. Um, that's just me. Um, but a lot of them come in different sort of configurations. They should have proper RCD protection and overcurrent protection and everything else appropriate to the duty of the circuit. You can feed final circuits off of these. You can feed other distribution boxes off them. We then go to the central distribution, which is like a load center. Consider it as a load center. Okay, and we'll drop these at uh, appropriate points around the installation, and then we can then fan out from these to final distribution uh, before we go down to final circuits. That means we can run some fairly large cables to these central points of use, and that again is important to reduce problems with volt drop. When we go to the final distribution unit, FDU, um, these are dropped nearer to the loads. What we're trying to do is keep that last length of cable going to the light fitting or the, the catering unit, whatever. We're trying to keep that as short as possible. So we will drop FDUs as close as we can to the uh, actual load itself. 
Each of these will have RCD protection. All outgoing circuits of a final circuit should be 30 milliamp instantaneous RCBO. Yeah. Um, no selectable RCDs on final circuits. Everything should come in the form of pre-tested, pre-inspected stock, stock items. So it's all been tested and inspected back at base, comes on site, hopefully in tip top condition. So it should have a valid um, test certificate with it. So is, you should be able to see that. Is that a PAT test? Just to answer Tom's question. It's similar, very similar to a PAT test. Um, cons just consider if you've got a three phase cable, obviously it is a little bit more than just a standard PAT test. Yeah, mm. but if you go by the code of practice, fourth edition, yeah, then yes, you're, you're looking for insulation, oh, sorry, continuity first, but you need to test continuity of all the conductors, not just the R1, R2. So you need to test the neutral as well. And then once you've done your continuity test, then you'll do an insulation resistance test again between all conductors. If it's three phase, you will also do phase rotation test. And uh, things like soccer packs as well? Soccer packs, we can test those as well. You can make up um, test leads. All right, which will then fit to your sort of standard testers um, and you can test yeah. your soccer packs in the same way. The issue yeah. with soccer packs is that they can sometimes might be different. So you've got to make sure you know how your soccer packs have been wired. So By you, become, that I mean, you, you become the master of adapters. You make your own little adapters to kind of configure you do, that instrument. You, you do indeed. Uh, <laughs> but it's very important if you do that, and we obviously you know we do, we've got a yeah. whole range of adapters. It's very important if you've got your own adapters that you've made up, you mark them up for testing purposes only, and you keep tight control over those. Don't let them go around the site, because otherwise you'll find people plugging them in and making cups of tea and doing Don't those lose them. strange things. Don't lose them, yeah, because they, they are worth their weight in gold. But yeah, if you make up the right sort of adapters, it's just like with any inspection and testing. You know, once you know what you're doing, you can make up a range of adapters to help you with that and assist with the process. And as long as you maintain, you manage those and you control them, that's absolutely fine. But don't let them go out on general release. Okay, again, this saves an awful lot of time because the stuff is coming pre-tested, pre-inspected. We can just simply plug it together. Yeah. Um, Compare that to lengths of cable being laid out, which you then got to terminate into a consumer unit and terminate into a socket outlet. It takes a lot longer. These are all pre-done and we just simply plug them together to provide a suitable system to deliver the power that we need. Saves an awful lot of time. So that's the sort of plan of a, a model system. You've got your generator in this case feeding an ISU. The ISU will feed a number of CDU, central distribution units, which will be nearer to the center of load. And from those CDUs, we'll feed out to a number of final distribution units. And hopefully, then just maybe just a single length to whatever the load's going to be, whether it's a light fitting, whether it's a fan, whether it's a, a music um, box or whatever. Okay, keeping those final circuit lengths to a minimum. Seven nine oh nine is very uh, careful about its choice of language. It uses the term system rather than installation. And one of the reasons behind that is, if we go to BS seven nine oh nine, from definitions, installation is items not forming part of the temporary system. Yeah, they're permanently fixed in a position for which they are not intended to be used or, or removed. So seven nine oh nine looks at as an installation as fixed installation part of the building fabric. Whereas the temporary system is all the stuff that we put in for the actual event and then remove afterwards. Fixed installations must be installed by competent electrically skilled persons. They've got to be inspected and tested and certified to be a 7671. So the level of skill and competence needs to be appropriate to that work. So it's, it's quite labor intensive and you need a certain level of knowledge and qualification to do that. Installing temporary systems, um, to be quite honest, Common sense yeah, is what most people need and a bit of brawn because most of what's being involved is lumping these things around and getting them installed and plugging them together. Dangerous words there, common sense. Oh, yeah, there you go. Yeah. So the assembly of uh, temporary systems normally requires no tools. There's also, most of the time, no requirement for any live work. Okay, when we do the testing, we do it using plugs and adapters. We're not actually accessing any live parts. 
It's mainly brawn rather than brain. I, I'm not being demeaning when I say that. I've installed a lot of these, um, so I'm including myself in that. Um, it's been described as an electrical Lego kit. It simply plugs together. But it, we must have good design and correct assembly. So there needs to be some sort of management. There needs to be some sort of skill level. Okay, because the technical aspects can often be the responsibility of the team leader, which is quite often refer, uh, referred to as the person responsible. When we look at 7909, it defines the person responsible as the person taking responsibility for the temporary electrical system. And it needs to be, the level of competence needs to be sufficient and suitable for the complexity of the temporary electrical system involved. Now, sufficient and suitable. So if you're just putting in a couple of extension leads, you don't really have to be a qualified electrician. If you're putting in a couple of extension leads, you can get them in, you can get them tested, and then you can hand them over to the person running the event. So if you're doing it mm -hmm. for a school fate, for instance, you can hand it over to the teacher and say, look, you know, you can take this on. You know, you're not going to drop the end in a bucket or start chewing on the cable or putting in the middle of a cooker or whatever, you, you assume they've got some common sense and you can hand the system over to them. That means that the person installing the system doesn't have to stay with it all day. Yeah. Whereas with larger systems like Glastonbury and whatever, you'll have guys permanently on site managing and looking after the system. Hmm. We we'll also have things like uh, people like instructed persons like we do in the electrical industry, uh, the fixed installations, uh, we'll have an instructed person and this is somebody who is adequately supervised uh, or advised by a skilled person. So a sort of standard team of people putting these electrical systems in would be made up of a certain amount of labor, the general muscle involved in putting the actual equipment out. There's lots and lots of equipment and it's quite heavy. So you're gonna need lots of people to get the equipment out and into place. These will be supported by semi-skilled people they may have experience of electrical systems, electrical knowledge. As an example, here comes the sales speak. Um, they may have completed the 709B course that we provide. Yeah? So they might have done that, or they could be a qualified electrician. Any sort of suitable qualification or knowledge for this level of skill for actually doing the tech, technical aspect of this, making sure that the RCDs are set properly, making sure that the overcurrent protection is set properly. Okay, we've got just not, um, I was going to say discrimination, <coughs> mustn't use that word, selectivity, selectivity. throughout the system. Yeah. yeah, making sure all those aspects of the system are. Because a lot of this kit will come with options to even switch off RCDs or bypass RCDs, or you'll have bypassing RCDs. And things. Yeah, bypassing RCDs. Yeah. Uh, it's one of the banes of my life. You go on to some of these major events, and the guys setting it up have bypassed all the RCDs. Uh, and when you talk to them and say, why have you bypassed the RCDs? The answer Stop is, tripping. well, we're only setting up. Yeah. yeah. And they bypass the RCDs to stop nuisance tripping and whatever when they're setting up. Now, the one time when people are going to be in direct contact with the metal work of, say, follow spots and light fittings on trusses and whatever is when they're setting up. So that's the one time when you really do want the RCDs to work. Yeah. So to my mind, the actual setup period is probably the most dangerous. So that's when you want all the RCDs in. If mm. people set the RCDs correctly to the right tripping current with the correct uh, time delay on them, then there shouldn't be a problem. And remember, we can have one amp or even three amp RCDs, and we can have time delays of a second or more. All right. So, you know, when people say to me, oh, yeah, but I get nuisance tripping. Well, it doesn't always wash with me. I think, well, you need to look at the type of RCDs you've got and perhaps, you know, either use different RCDs, put different RCDs in your equipment, maybe the higher rating or a longer trip, uh, delay. Yeah, but there, there's always a way of putting RCD protection in. All right? Unless you've got real faults on your cables, then they should be okay. Under normal use, they, they shouldn't be a problem. It's just a case of setting the system up properly and having the right type of equipment. Um, sometimes the limitations are in the equipment itself. You might get a distro that comes with a 100 milliamp um, instantaneous RCD. Well, that's like a chocolate teapot. It's, it's of no use whatsoever. Yeah. 
is no use to you at all. Um, so I, I'm I'm dead against 100 milliamp RCDs anyway. I normally go from a 30 to a 300, but that's that's another day. We'll talk about okay. that. Uh, the responsible person or a person responsible, if it's a lot, you know, you may have more than one of these if you've got a really large event. If you've got something like Glastonbury, you may have a different person responsible for each, um, each stage. stage or maybe for each field or whatever. Uh, and these persons responsible are responsible for the system in their own area. They will then report to a senior person responsible. Okay, and all these people must have sufficient skills and knowledge and be competent of these systems and the equipment they are dealing with. All right. The senior person responsible is the only person that needs to talk to the event manager. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when we're looking at persons responsible, they need that level of knowledge, that level of understanding and that experience. Um, and we do provide a 7909, 7909C course, yeah, which takes people into inspection and testing and then goes further on from there. We've also got the D course, which looks a bit more like the design. Okay. But obviously any qualified electricians, you know, they would be hopefully, you know, perfectly okay with this type of system it's, it's, and their yeah. skills and knowledge would, would give them the understanding. <clears throat> it's just a case of adapting to using different types of gear. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the inspection and testing, yeah, remember that the first thing we should test is the supply. No matter how good our kit is, and we could have tested all our equipment to with an inch of its life, it could be perfect, it could be gold plated, it could be the best kit ever. If we go and plug it into a socket that's got a dodgy earth on it, now our system is dangerous. Yeah. So the most important aspect of the setting up process and the first bit of inspection and testing is to test the supplies you're coming from. Always test your supplies, making sure that you've got the right uh, earthing, that you've got the right level of fault current, that you've got the right phase rotation and right polarity. Okay, it's very important. If you've got any RCDs on there, make sure they're checked, make sure they're working, make sure they're set appropriately. That's most important when we're setting up. And quite often gets overlooked. People set their system up, just plug into a local socket outlet, hoping it's okay. And I had this at an event up in London when we were setting up um, for a, a major sort of indoor sort of um, event there. And it was a 63 amp socket outlet in each room and the guys had plugged into those thinking great we've got a 63 amp three phase when i looked at the protection it was only 20 amp yeah so i had to go around to all the guys and say hang on guys you haven't got what you expect you've got you know you've only got 20 amps not 63. Mm. oh yeah but it's a 63 amp socket it might be a 63 amp socket but it's only a 20 amp circuit breaker behind it mm. all right so it's very important to check your supply also, remember in, uh, when we were in Dubai, the whole hall had just 30 milliamp RCDs <laughs> on all of this, all oh, of the 32 yeah. amp and 63 amp sockets. No time delay, no nothing. No, nope, no. Yeah. yeah. And then they wonder why they had problems. Yeah. Because all the cables are pre tested, all the units are pre tested, there's no requirement for continuity, no requirement for installation resistance tests. What we get the guys to do is as they're laying out the leads, well, as they're laying out the equipment, all the extension leads, the the HO7 leads, we will get them to just do a quick inspection on them as I lay them out. Okay. And I'm not talking about millimeter by millimeter. I'm talking about lay them out and just keep an eye on what you're doing. So if you see any obvious signs of damage or any obvious signs of the cables coming out of the end, you know, then obviously those leads are put out of service, labeled up and put to one side. Um, and what I tend to get to people do, and I often get funny looks when I'm doing this is the shake and sniff, you know, which is you get to the C form outlet, or the, or the plug and you give it a shake listening for any loose screws inside give it a sniff because if there's any loose connections any signs of arcing and stuff in there you will smell it long before you see it and it takes about two seconds guys just as you're doing it give it a shake give it a sniff you may get some strange looks but it may save you you know having a, a nasty event later on yeah see the micro machines there they're shake and sniff apparently is that what came up when you, is that like a Google search <laughs> yeah. or what? So. Yeah, I've never seen them before. You shake them and they actually smell like the loads. So, oh, right, okay. yeah, yeah, I'm going to buy the cheese and onion one. As I said before, in practice, we, we, we actually energize the system as we lay it out um, with a couple of exceptions. Um, the dead tests have all been carried out back at base. So this is acceptable. We need a live supply when we're putting the distro in because guys have got to set up RCDs, 
put the right time delay in there, put the right tripping current in there, okay, and check warning lights and stuff like that. So it needs to be done as they're doing the install. Once completed, the system can be tested. The tests we carry out for BS7909 are earth fault loop impedance, and we test that at all the distros and at the end of circuits. So thinking about earth fault loop impedance, just a, a quick question um, for you guys. If you had a ZS of five ohms, for instance, on the end of a circuit, protected by a 16 amp type C RCBO, would you accept it as okay? There's something to think about. Five ohms on a 16 amp type C, would you accept that as being okay? On an RCBO. Okay. While these guys are doing this poll, I'll just update you on the previous two polls. Yep, go on. 80% uh, of people have heard of BS7909. That's encouraging. And 72% work with generators. That's good. Yeah, that's good. It's nice. It's nice to see guys are actually not just doing with fixed installations. It's nice to see guys are actually sort of uh, widening out there and generators, you know, some people worry about generators, but generators are a great source of supply and I, I opt for generators wherever possible. This one's, um, this one's going up slower. People have a good think about this one. Oh, I know. That's good, uh, then. Yeah, they have a good little yeah. thing about this one. Yeah. The other thing to consider about, um, yeah, what was I say about generators? Um, I've got a question about generators. If you want to talk about generators, um, Sean has said, are there considerations given to generator supply and how it might feed equipment near other earthed or bonded parts of a fixed wiring system? Yes, there are particular requirements when we're using a generator. Um, if you're using a generator as well as a fixed supply, okay, then we need to actually join the earthing systems together. If they're covering the same electrical environment, what we call the electrical environment, which is basically the geographic area that the system is lying in, by connecting the generator earthing system and the, the fixed earthing system together, okay, we can make sure that they're all starting at the same point, point zero. Um, if we've got generators, different generators, again, supplying different environments, we would link the earth system to the generator. Now, 7909 shows that as a direct link from the generator to the fixed installation earth um, point or from the generator to the generator. But there are other ways of doing it, and we can actually do it via distro. Okay, as long as we link the earth systems together, then we're minimizing any difference in voltage between the systems. And it's, it is important. But uh, I say another thing to consider about the use of generators, if you've got a PME system and you're trying to supply caravans, you can't do it on PME, mm. but you can do it off a generator. Off a, generator. a generator. A generator is actually a TNS system. TNS. Yeah. And people quite often get confused about that. They say, well, hang on, well, no, it's, isn't it TT? Because it's got an earth electrode on it. And that's another, that's another subject they would talk about. But even right. though it's got an earth electrode on it, it is actually a TNS system. The earth okay. electrode is only for reference. It's not actually providing an earth. I'm going to give this poll 10 more seconds, and then it takes okay. it to three minutes because we've got nearly 50% people have voted. So. Who's sitting on the fence? Come on. Yeah, a lot of fence sitters. Yes or no? There we go, in the poll. Right. Okay. 61% uh, no. 40% yes. No. Okay. Right. That's the interesting question, and that's the interesting thing about BS7909 is because we are dealing with such long, long lengths of cable, okay, all the final circuits are RCBO protected. So having a 5 ohm ZS is actually okay because the earth foot protection yeah, is provided by the RCBO. And this is one of the issues when we get into the inspection and testing of 7909. Okay, we have to look at the difference between what is earth fault and what is short circuit. Mm. Okay, what is more of an issue is short circuit because if you had a five ohm earth loop on a cable at the end of a circuit, what I'd be more interested in is the actual short circuit current because I run the next pole then under earth fault protection. Yeah, the RCBO should operate providing it's been maintained, has been tested, and is actually working okay. But it's relying on the RCD, isn't it? But under short circuit protection, the RCD part of it will not work. So you're relying on the overcurrent part of the RCBO to give you short circuit protection. 
Mm -hmm. So that comes on to the next question is, do you ever carry out short circuit tests at the end of final circuits, guys? End of the final circuit. This is not I'm a not supply to, test. I'm not talking about the, the DB. I'm not talking about the, the origin. I'm talking about at the end of the final circuit. Do any of you ever carry out short circuit testing at the end of the final circuit? Just a yes or no. Let's see how that one goes. Yeah, this is this is um, one of the issues with temporary systems. And that's why every final circuit is RCBO protected is because uh, we have these high earth loops because of the length of the cables. Well, we, and we, 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 we cannot get same, over that. We see the same excuse given to be a 7671 where an earth fault in pins are not achievable. The RCDs can be right because it, it focuses so much on earth fault. Yes. Fault protection. Yes. Um, instead of short circuit protection. Okay. We and have a similar pattern. 60% okay. voted, so I'll stop it there. Same number of voted. And again, it's 50, 50, uh, 60 uh, no, 40 yes. Right, okay. Right, one of the particular issues in with short circuit is that RCDs do not work under short circuit. Because the same amount of current is flowing down the line and back on the neutral, the RCD will not operate. So if you've got a 40 amp RCD and you put 80 amps through it, um, it won't actually trip. It might eventually, if you put enough current through it, it might melt it might catch fire and might trip then but it won't actually trip out on overcurrent they're not an overcurrent protected device when we look at temporary installations because of these long lengths of cable the the big issue we have is short circuit and we've had a number of occasions where we've had to re rewire places that have been wired by other people because i'll take it for one uh, one particular instance where we had a um earth loop of about 4.5 ohms on a, a lighting circuit which when I say a lighting circuit is about 200 meters long mm. and I wasn't worried about the earth loop because the RCD would protect the earth fault I was more worried about the fault current when I did a fault current test I had a fault current of about 70 amps just remember this is the short circuit fault current. short circuit fault current of about 70 amps now this was protected by a type C 16 amp RCBO. When I looked at appendix three in the wiring regs and I looked at the time current curve, the actual device under overcurrent would trip within about, it was about coming up for about four minutes. Yeah. When I did the adiabatic equation, the, the one for thermal withstand, yeah, which is T equals I squared, squared, S squared, S squared yeah. over I squared. Yeah, that's the one, yeah. Okay the actual cable that caught fire in six seconds at that level of fault current. Mm. So the real issue there was not earth fault and electric shock. It was covered by the RCBO. The real issue there was fire. Yeah, because we had such a long circuit, the fault current level was reduced to a point where the overcurrent protection and the RCBO would not provide adequate protection. Okay operation within three and about about three minutes and 40 seconds but a fire operate or happening in in six seconds okay so the fire risk was the biggest problem there so what we had to do was actually strip that out and we put in seven different circuits we broke the circuit down into seven different circuits so is, cost, is, is 7909 adjusted to accommodate for this then 7909 when you look at the testing certificates which we'll look at in a minute mm -hmm. includes testing of fault current at the end of circuits now because of my experience in this i've actually brought this into fixed installations I test, I test for uh, fault current at the end of fixed installations eic's and eicr's mm -hmm. and you were with me a few weeks ago mm -hmm. on a fixed installation where we came across a similar problem we did yeah we did indeed. And it wasn't the earth fault that was a problem. They had RCD yep. protection. It's it was the fault current. It was a fire risk, C30, not an electric shock. C32 radio with a 4 mil, and it had something like 190 amp of short circuit current. Something like that, yeah. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. So this is something we've got to start thinking about, guys. When we're looking at temporary installations, we've got to start thinking short circuit current. That is the, the real problem. If we've got RCD mm. protection on all our final circuits, mm. For, uh, electric shock not so much of an issue fire risk huge okay so on our inspection and testing for fire uh temporary installations we will do earth fault looping pins at the distro and at the end of circuits we would do fault current at the distros and at the end of circuits 
and we will do random RCD tests. All the RCDs, as what I tend to do, is I get the guys as they're installing to always test all the RCDs using the push button. But I will then also test a sample of RCDs on site. I won't test them all because you just have not got time, mm. but I will do random tests. Remembering all these pieces of equipment have been tested back at base. Recheck, so we're yeah. just doing a bit of a recheck. Yeah, just to sort of keep people on their toes. The certification, there's our, oh, come back. There's our schedule of test results. Okay, and there should be one of these for at least, uh, at least one of these for every DB, every distro that we've got. And that will include the circuit details. It will include things like, is it a final circuit? Is it a distribution circuit? You can see column 11 there, PSCC. Yeah. That's what we've just been talking yeah. about. Okay, it includes the RCD details uh, and have you tested the RCD? Have you ever tested it by measurement or have you tested it by push button? And it includes polarity, phase rotation, earth loop, and as you say, perspective short circuit current. That's a very important test which needs to be done. We don't want any fires happening on these events, especially if you've got an event. And this particular event I was talking about, this lighting was in a marquee. It was a two-tier two marquee. And it was the lighting underneath the first floor. Uh, and there were 700 people in that marquee when the event went on. Mm. Now you consider a fire in that sort of situation, it's yeah. not great for business. Yeah. We also will produce a completion certificate for each source. So if you've got a generator feeding a number of an ISU and a couple of F, uh, CDUs and three or four FDUs, you will have one completion certificate and let's say eight, nine, 10, 14 schedules of test results, one for each bit of DB. Yeah. And each of those DBs will list a number of circuits. Okay. The completion certificate will be handed to the event manager. If it's a, an event with just one source. The person responsible needs to keep a copy, always keep a copy of your test certs so you've got evidence, you've got proof. Because believe you me, if something goes wrong, yeah, you want that, you want to have that in your pocket to say, yes, I did do this job, I did do it properly, I did do the inspection and testing. All right? If you've handed everything over, it's funny how often they can go missing or get adjusted, altered. Yeah? I've known people change dates on them. Um, yes. So keep a copy of your certificates, guys. Make sure, and it, you can take a photo of it. Nowadays, with mobile phones, ideal. You can take a photo of these things, and then you've got that evidence. If you've got a number of completion certificates to produce, because you've got more than one supply, you might have maybe five or six generators, or you might be me using the fixed installation plus a couple of generators. You will also need to do a confirmation of electrical completion. This is a one-page thing to say yes, the electrical system is complete and it's all been signed off. And then that document will go to the event manager instead. Okay, the senior person responsible keeps a copy. Remember the event manager on these things is quite often, they're juggling all the balls. They're looking after cleaning, they're looking after security, they're looking after parking, they're looking after catering, they're looking after uh, the acts coming in and out, the movement of the public, all sorts of stuff. Uh, quite often they've got no electrical knowledge whatsoever. They don't want to see a whole ream of inspection schedules and test schedules and certificates. All they want to see is a piece of paper saying, yes, it's all safe, it's all done, it's all okay. They won't understand the rest of it, most of them. So all they need is that completion certificate. There you go, all done, all complete, we're ready to go. And that's all they need. The senior person responsible or the person responsible will keep the rest of it in a folder. Yeah, make sure you've got those. So to summarize, BS7909, it covers temporary electrical systems for entertainment, okay? So temporary, they come out again at the end of their use for entertainment and related purposes. Well, that's a bit of a fudgy area. A lot of it is fairly simple. If you're looking at things like festivals and um, cinema and theater, yeah, that's straightforward. But exhibitions and things, it gets a little bit blurred. My personal opinion is, you know, I prefer to wire using 7909. I think it's safer. I think it's quicker. I think it's easier. I think the inspection and testing protocol is better. But as we heard earlier on, some places you'll go to and they'll ask you to do it the other way. Yeah. Maybe they need to have a chat with them. I don't know. But um, 7909 allows for system to be assembled by operators who do not need to be qualified electricians. Okay. 
but we do need to have somebody there who is suitably competent, suitably knowledgeable, suitably qualified to take um, control and to take responsibility for the system. So you often work with a team of people with different skills and different levels of knowledge. It's, it's, um, it's one of the key things. I mean, we've said it's like Lego, you know, this size fits this, run it in long lengths, lots of, lots of um, heavy lifting. But, you know, we need to know the data, the fault currents, the devices will disconnect. So we need to have yeah. that competence on the work. The work yeah. still needs that competence, maybe not for part of the erection but it needs to be there for the certification fundamentally. It's, it's a mixture of skills and attribute, attributes that you need. Um, you need people that can move stuff around, but you also need people that know what they're doing, can follow design and get things set up properly. So it's a, it's a combination of skills and you know it, it allows for development. This is a good thing about it, is you can bring people in and then develop them and, and sort of lead them onto higher learning and you know build their knowledge and their understanding. The inspection and testing protocol about BS790 is suitable and sufficient for this type of system. Okay. Often, and as we can see from the test, show, the test sheets that I've shown you, the BS7671 EICs do not work for temporary systems. Okay. A lot of it is irrelevant and unnecessary, and they're just not fit for purpose. So that is why we quite often will use BS7909 for some temporary installations that arguably are in the fudgy area, the, the, the murky bits, yeah? But we use it anyway because it's a better way. Was, it's a safer system. It's better for the purpose. There was a question about this. Um, does, does Spear 7909 um, give you competence to work on festival sites or do you also need to know 7671? You need both. You need you, you'll need somebody in the team who has got the relevant skills, knowledge, and experience of electrical systems. Full stop. Whether they're fixed or whether you know electrical systems or electrical systems, we need to know about how protection works, how earthing systems work, what's mm. bonding all about. They need to have that understanding. Be able to do out the ca the cable calculations, work out loading, work out things like uh, um, power oh. factor. Which like you just really, described really with the um, the, the, the adiabatic. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. you need that knowledge. You need that level of knowledge. Okay, so I'm not saying this is Mickey Mouse stuff. This is really important stuff, and you need people within the industry who know what they're doing. But it does enable people with very little knowledge to come in at the installation level, yeah, and over a period of time learn and ex get the experience and, and get the knowledge from other also, people and you can build worth, people up. yeah it's also worth mentioning that a lot of people enter the industry in this sector from other areas like from tv from other yeah. lighting they enter the electrical industry in the 7999 corner and so you know they they start work there and then they have to kind of develop from that point so there's you know there's a yeah. there's a lot of people doing the work who haven't obviously developed level three training in electrotechnical yeah. anything <laughs> so there's also a number of people that enter the industry because they're either relatives or friends or whatever um, of somebody that that does this work, and they say, "Oh, we need an extra pair of hands." Pair of hands, because that's the yeah. thing. It's it's a, yeah, it's lots it's of labor. It's very labor intensive. The actual yeah. installation and the removal is very labor intensive, um, and, and and that, as I say, is an opportunity for everybody there. Uh, it's a great industry to be in, um, and it can get you into all sorts of places and into all sorts of uh, scrapes and shenanigans. Um, it's a very, really interesting aspect, I, I think, uh, as part of my electrical career. Um, we've had some really fun times with temporary systems, and it's got me to some it's, weird, moments weird where and wild just, places. Yeah, those moments where you just stand still and scratch your head with amusement of what you're looking at. Yeah, a lot of that, yeah, a lot of that yeah, happens. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But as I say, it's a great industry to be in. And as as a, an offshoot of the electrical industry, yeah, it's fabulous. Yeah, it's really so that's about it. Okay, um, I've, got, I've got some comments and some questions I can go through. Go on. Uh, one thing, um, it's not really a question, but it's something that we probably would agree with. Terry Austin says catering wagons are the worst. <laughs> ah! <laughs> yeah. <So. laughs> oh, caterers, caterers. Yeah. yeah, caterers are a bane of my life. Um, yeah, we had. Uh, we had a situation years ago uh, when we, uh, we did a regular gig at a major sporting event 
um, where year after year, the same catering wagons used to come in and they used to come in with bits and pieces hanging off them. There was cables hanging out the wall, light fittings falling down and all sorts of nonsense. And uh, it got to the stage where I just had to say, look, we can't keep doing this. You need to come in. They should be arriving on site with an EIC or an EICR. Mm. And that is the requirement of 7909, is that any portable mobile units arrive on site with that documentation. Uh, and as we all know, that, uh, is that likely to happen? Mm. Yeah. There's that flying pig again. Um, but I did actually manage to get this firm to listen. And we had a situation uh, where we used to go up every February to their depot in London. And we actually got the job of servicing all their vehicles and putting them right. Mm. So then when they turned up in June for this event, they were all in good condition and they had an EIC uh, mm -hmm. or an EICR. Um, but that's, that's the requirement of 7909 is they should have an EIC or an EICR and they should actually hand a copy of that to the person responsible. There's a lot of shoulds there. Otherwise, you shouldn't give them yeah. a supply. And this, yeah. Yeah, as you say, is a lot of shoulds there because we all know when you get on one of these uh, jobs, it's you get your ear bent. Well, you know that the event opens in two hours' time. and you, <laughs> The event's going to happen. Problem. Yeah, the event is going to happen. And quite often, the, the people running the event will get money off the caterer. So they don't yeah. want to upset the caterers. No, um, they do. It's all revenue for them. So we've got to try to educate these people. We've got to try mm. and educate them and say, look, you need to do this. We can't keep doing, you know, especially if they got what cables hanging out the walls and light fittings hanging down. Uh, yeah. yeah, we need to educate them. It's a process. Yes, we could just say no, you're not having electricity, but we know what will happen as soon as you turn <laughs> your back, they'll go and plug in anyway. Okay, so, okay, um, okay, Mr. Electrician, they wait for you to go around the corner. They'll just yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you know you've seen it happen. Yeah. yeah. All right, two other comments I'm going to combine here. Uh, first of all, so is this just plug and play? And I'm going to then say, we're going to mention Charlotte's comment here. Is there an argument, therefore, that if you have a stand in an exhibition, the stand might have its own wiring? So you may have lighting displays to a little board. You've seen these fuse boards yep. on a stand. Yeah. And then obviously you plug that into distro. So is that, is that stand to 7 <laughs> Eleven? Or is that stand an abomination? Yeah. Or is that stand under 7 9 Benz is wired it. Uh, if you remember from Dubai, we had quite a few stands in the exhibitions that we did um, consultancy on, mm. um, much to our dismay. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's one of those where quite often these stands are built uh, and then, as you say, they have like a socket outlet and you just provide a supply to that and that livens everything up. Yeah. Now, what you've got to do in those sort of situations is you've got to have a, deb a, a demarcation point where you say, look, I am testing and inspecting to this point here. That's where my responsibility ends. And you hand over the responsibility of all the different stands to the people that have built them. Mm. And that's the only way it'll work. Unless, mm -hmm. of course, the event people give you several days where you can go around and test every individual stand. Mm. And then what happens when you find faults? Who's going to put those right? Yeah. You know. So it's much it's, it's much easier and cleaner to say, this is where my my inspection and testing and certification ends at this point here. Yeah. I've tested to there. It's your responsibility to do that mess. Okay. All right, cool. Um, David's mentioned maybe a limit on the time for retesting, more regular and monitoring maybe. Do you think that the person who designs the event uh, would then determine the frequency of maintenance? I mean, it events, should be down. Can, events can change shape. You know, they can. Set yeah. a supply up, and then without knowing, the event coordinators could go, well, the first two days didn't work very well. They can move things around. So how is the management of an event handled in that way? The, the designer is best placed to say how long the actual system that they've designed yeah, should be okay for. They are the person that's best placed for that. They've got the knowledge, the experience, and hopefully the qualifications. Um, and that could be part of the certification process. And they say, right, okay, fair enough this is okay for three months or this is okay for two months. Yeah. However, as you know, things change. Uh, the usage can change. The environmental conditions can change. And so whoever is, if you've got a system that's in for a period of time, it's got to be managed. It's, it's somebody has got to be there to manage it. Mm. You can't just go away and leave it. 7909 says that you should have a, a person responsible. Yeah. On site for those larger systems. So, 
that person would then be going around. What we tended to do, as you remember on the events that we've done, is we'd go around every day and do a, a walk around, an inspection. Like a patrol. And believe you me, the amount of stuff you can find by inspection yeah. is huge. Yeah, Testing definitely. is a tiny part of it. And we, we're going to go further on this when we talk about the EICRs and EICs and another webinar. Yeah. But people underestimate what you can, can do with inspection. By inspection when you're looking at things when you're touching things when you're listening to things and smelling things using your senses you can tell an awful lot and 80 percent 85 percent maybe even more of the issues that we get when we're doing eicrs is by inspection not by testing yeah so a walk around every day yeah is is great you can walk around you can see and you can highlight issues you can see where things have changed you can see if people have added stuff coming back to caterers yeah oh another wagon's turned up <laughs> another yeah. one's popped in we remember, sell, you remember sell we more had, burgers two years ago or so we had uh was it a three phase and then suddenly there was three of them or something you remember yeah yeah one of the caterers they just you you put you had your design your design said put 32 out of three phase in there but you go there and there's three of them yeah well going yeah. back going back even further we used to have um on this major event that we used to do years ago uh on the design the caterer was asking for 13 amps and this was for a uh a, a baked potato wagon right and we knew by experience that it actually took six and three, three phase yeah uh and on that occasion we said okay fair enough and i actually went back to these people about three times are you sure you only want 13 amps are you sure you only want 13 amps knowing full well they actually needed 63 amp three phase and every time they asked for 13 amps so when they turned up, there was just a 13 amp plug waiting for them. Oh, yeah. We'd um, actually hit, we'd hidden the 63 amp three phase behind the marquee. <laughs> we'd actually put it in because we knew put it, it was going to happen. Just wanted them to... We were on a hiding to nothing. We knew we'd get asked to put it in anyway, yeah. but we just left a 13 amp trail in there and let them sweat for a few hours. <clears throat> I just want to read Rich, uh, Richard's comment here. In my experience, you can't always rely on equipment being fit for purpose that is tested. No be it supplied by a hired company or by the venue. In my no. testing experience on temp systems, I've come across brand new 60 amp cables made by reputable suppliers and tested having line to neutral reverse. Also brand new cables from suppliers like CPC wired line to neutral reverse. Thankfully the 799 testing I was doing picked these up. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and this is very much the case. I totally agree. We do get brand new stuff coming out which is incorrect we get stuff which has been allegedly inspected and tested coming out i get this on every event there's always a number of leads which are incorrect polarity or the phase rotation is wrong or whatever um what do we do about that well okay in the initial stages it all gets plugged together and we liven it up as i say we do sampling we sample as much as we can but when you do your earth fault loop testing and your fault current testing any polarity faults will be highlighted and picked up if I get these that have got the wrong polarity, mm. basically they're just taken out and we just put them to one side and I just let the people know, hang on, you need to replace this lead. And we get the same with the end of leads hanging out. We did, you were with me at Stourhead? Yep. Yeah. And we had that catering wagon there, which had a, a lead, which had the end hanging That's out it. of it. You could yeah. see the basic insulation inside. Yeah. And we just took that straight out of service and dumped it to one side. And we yeah. rang up the people and said, you need to replace this. And they did very quickly. Yeah. yeah, you will always get a number of these things. The world is not perfect. And this is the other thing we've got to remember. The world is not perfect. What we're trying to do to the best of our ability in the time and cost constraints that we're given is to improve safety and make sure we've got a system which is safe and suitable. Mm. Okay, We can't do the impossible. We do the best we can. As with all inspection and testing, under Guidance Note 3, and it's also stated in BS7909, we have to sample. We can't test every little tiny thing. We haven't got the time. It just physically is not the time to do it. So we have to sample. Now, I tend to go with a sampling rate of about 30 to 40% on, on large installations. Uh, if it's a small installation, I might do 100%. But obviously with a large installation like Glastonbury, you imagine testing yeah. that, well, that's going to take days. We're going to talk about sampling in um, one of our upcoming yeah. EICR webinars yeah. as well. Uh, a number of people have asked about accessing this. I'm going to, if the recording quality, you can all see this is being recorded. If it, if it's, or if the audio is good, I'll be putting it up um, on YouTube or something for you guys to all go back and revisit it. A uh, good post here from Andrew. Uh, problem arises where the supply to the building is PME but the extensions are being used outside 
So they've taken, they've exported it. They've taken the system outside. We had a system like that just before Christmas where they were using extension leads outside in a metal structure. And we started to say, well, we've got PME outside now. So yeah. we've taken extensions outside and the non-qualified persons would not be aware of potential issues that you may have mm -hmm. if you take your PME outside. Yeah, similar to if you've got a PME system in a, in a house and you're taking it out to a outside building which has got maybe a metal structure or whatever you may want to change your pme to a, a tt you may the same with electric vehicle charging or if you're providing a supply on a caravan park you may want to change your pme system to a tt system uh, and that's actually fairly simple to do all right um probably is that we've actually got information on that on the b course um the 7909 yeah. b course but it's, it's one of these things that if if people are interested it's something we can do a, a short webinar on is how we change from a pme, PME to, to a tt yeah, system yeah. and this this would this would sort of cover all those sort of eventualities when you're feeding a metal structure off of a temporary system yeah. uh, coming off a fixed pme if you're feeding an outside structure at home if you're feeding car charging if you're feeding a caravan pickup point it covers all those eventualities. It's probably one that's worth doing. We can put a, a short webinar together on that. Yeah, we're, 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 you know, we're just trying to get a good understanding of what people could benefit from. And if, you know, we'll, we'll seek some. Um, so, yeah, thanks for that. That's a good idea. Um, Charla says, installing an electrode, what resistance would we be looking for? Is it similar to the TT system values defined in 7671? Oh, yes. Yeah, when you, when you put an earth electrode in, you test the earth resistance. Um, yeah. The, the issues we have, obviously, is that when you've got an earth electrode on a fixed system, one way of testing it is doing a live test using earth loop. Um, of course, you can't do that on a, uh, a, a generator with an earth rod because it's not the same. The earth rod is there for a totally different purpose. It's there for reference rather than actually providing an earth. Um, we actually did a very short video on this, a, a, a system that we went to not long ago. Mm where I actually removed the earth rod and it made absolutely no difference at all. <laughs> difference also, absolutely no yeah. difference at all to the actual earthing yeah. of the generator. If the generator, in fact, we had a generator at one of these other events, which was actually up on rubber wheels uh, and was totally insulated from the ground. Yeah. So it could have been hanging on a piece of string hovering in midair it's still got an earth on it it's, it's still tns it's got an earth on it it's internally wired the earth comes from the internal wiring of the generator however that earth will be different to true earth okay yeah. so if you've got a number of generators all in the same situation you may end up with different voltages between the earth systems obviously if your earth is at a different level then your voltages are going to be at a different level so if you've got 230 volts on l1 off of generator A and 230 volts on L1 off generator B, you might find that you've got 12 or 14 or 16 volts between those two, those two yeah. L1s. We've, so, we've done this a number of times. We've just yeah. we've been sat there with Earthfall and Beans testers, and we've been going, "That's metal. That's over there." We've been playing with it, just seeing how yeah. it varies the yeah. impedances yeah. to understand so, it better. We could put you could put something on earthing and bonding or something yeah. together on the, the webinar. The, base, the basic requirement is when you put an earth rod in is just to do your earth resistance check and it has to be done using a proper earth resistance tester it can't be done using earth loop because there yeah. is no earth loop yeah you haven't got a loop there for earthing uh you're you're just testing the earth resistance of the soil mm -hmm. um and that's it remember the your earth rod is there for reference that's it you're just referencing your generator earth back down to true earth yeah and by doing that on all the generators and the fixed system yeah then all our earth points are at the same level by keeping all our earths at the same level, then obviously all our voltages should potentially be at the same level. Okay. Um, there's so, 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 so many comments. Um, let me just go to a couple. Oh, all right. Uh, why 300 million? Why not 100 million RCDs? <laughs> uh, it's just me being an old git, really. Um, no, if, uh, if you test a, th a 30 milliamp RCD, um, you're going to be testing it at times half, times one, times five. If it's there for ADS, yeah. Yeah, so or additional if, you test, protection, yeah. if you do want to do a times five test on a 30 milliamp RCD, if you've got a 100 milliamp RCD behind that, you're testing at 150 milliamps, there's a good chance you're going to trip out the 100 milliamp RCD. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's why I tend to go to 300. And that's it's just a personal thing. There's no reason why you can't go with 100. Mm -hmm. But if you look at BS7909, if you've got a copy of 7909, they don't actually list the use of 100 milliamps. You can use them. There's nothing wrong with using them. 
all right but it's not actually prescribed in 7909 they do the same they go from 30 to 300 to 500 to one amp yeah. to three amp yeah and it's it's to do with the fact that you know when i come to if i'm going to test i don't i'm old i don't want to keep walking backwards and forwards from one distro to another you know because right, okay. I've, I've tripped out the 100 milliamp rcd so it's just a personal choice okay uh jay's put from a theater point of view you'll often have different phases going to the same set piece or metal structure needing bonding is this covered under 7909 theater has a need in its own sort of guidance for a long time um is theater not in that yellow book Theatre ABTT, isn't it? Um, yeah. uh, ABTT actually uh, drew up a but, yellow book. The, the electrical part of that is not huge. No. Um, it's temporary systems. If you're, if you're bonding, um, then a bond is a bond. Uh, and if you're taking three phase supplies to that same metal structure, absolutely fine. As long as you've got the right protection, as long as all your, te your cables are tested. The HO7 cables, if you're using HO7, pretty much provide double insulation because they're so robust they've got the the the, um, the actual uh, sheathing on the outside then insulation on the inside effectively giving them a effectively double insulation so running those around a metal gantry is absolutely no problem as long as your cables have been inspected and tested and are in good condition if you then got your rcd protection set properly on your outgoing circuits there should be no issues at all with having lights or other pieces of equipment on that same metal gantry running off at different phases okay providing all the equipment is tested providing the system is set up providing all your rcds are, or rcbos are working properly and it's all been inspected and tested properly then there should be no issues okay i'm, I'm trying to find some key questions that we could quickly respond to because there's so many now um what about if stands bring their own generators who's responsible a stand comes and brings their own jenny who's responsible there is it its own system what's we'll see if they bring their own generators to do their own stuff it's their own responsibility and that should be arranged with the event manager and what i would do on my documentation is i'd actually pinpoint it and say look just as a risk assessment that stand there that stand there that stand there nothing to do with me okay. and it, it's saying... it, unfortunately this is the world we live in in it, we cannot take responsibility for other people's stuff no um and the other thing we get um is, which is sort of a follow-on from that is you quite often if you're doing the power for the lighting and stuff you might be providing uh supply to a stage and then you get the the roadies come in and plug all the equipment in for the for the act now, yeah we can only test and inspect to the outlets or the distro we put in for them that's as far as we can go when they come in and put all their stuff in they're supposed to inspect and test that so what i tend to do is i call that a separate section yeah so rather like with glastonbury we might sort of separate the different fields and the different stages you know and have different persons responsible i would say well, okay fair enough i'm the person responsible up to that point and then you've got to have your own person responsible for your equipment and all the systems you're putting in my system is safe my supply is safe my distro is safe you're plugging into it you're responsible for that bit okay and we need to get that message over to event managers and to production companies and whatever to say, look, you need to be responsible for your own stuff. All right. Because it, it, there's no way we can take responsibility for it. Quite often these guys come in sort of like 11 o'clock at night or something rather, and they set the thing up and they're all working through the night. And so it's ready for the next day. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm, all, I'm, I'm tucked in from bed by then. I'm tucked in up in bed by past nine with a cup of cocoa. Right, it's we're, we're an hour and twenty four minutes now. Um, the questions are, I, mean, I can try and get all the questions, but more are coming in. What I think is probably best, guys, is I mean, I'm accessible on social media. If you have any per, uh, direct questions, there's some questions about obviously further information or training on this as well. Um, contact myself, or if you look on social media, you might be able to find Phil Ascot College. Uh, if not, just just come to me, and I can redirect you to him. Um, I've got a Discord, which has got a BS7909 discussion area, which, uh, you know, you're more than welcome to join and go in there. Uh, Phil's in there, I'm in there, there's many other people in there as well. It's, it's up to you guys, but we're not going to have time to get to all of these questions to give them, a, you know, a, an honest response. But We will um, be doing another one of these, won't we? We're going to do another one, yeah. I think, we're, we're, I, think, we're looking... I, think, I think we've got it scheduled in for sometime next week, possibly. Yeah, we're just looking at, obviously, first of all, we're just practicing this, making sure we don't balls this up. Uh, looks like we're doing okay at the moment. 
Um, but yeah, no. once once we're confident in our ability to actually not mess this up for you guys, we'll do some more. Um, and we, we can bring the subject up again. I've had some good requests here for PME to TT. There's earthing and bonding. So we can bring up all sorts of subjects on this. But, you know, after this webinar, I'm going to look at the video. I can upload it to um, my YouTube channel for everyone to view back um, if it's good enough. If not, we will do it again anyway. Uh, but, you know, we're accessible, we're reachable. Find us, anyone who's asked us for some more information. If I've not been able to get an answer, a question to fill now, or if we can't get to you straight away, just come back and you know, we will get back to you as soon as we can. Um, but I think I think it's probably time to call this one, Pop. Okay, I'm happy with that. You've got one tonight, haven't you? Six o'clock? I've got one at 6 p.m., which is the uh, my, my, my idea on the future of BS7671, looking at, obviously, uh, HD60364, etc. I shall be watching. Okay. All right. Um, okay, guys. Uh, thank you for taking part, and thank you for your your contributions. It's, it's nice to know that we've got a lot of people in the chat here that actually, you know, are in this area, are in this sector, and there's lots of great input. That's that's really really encouraging. Um, thank you for your time. Oh, very good. Thank yeah. You. Thanks very much, guys. All right. Take care. And, uh, see you soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.